Welcome to Episode 2 of The Seed by Dan Thomas, published in 1967, adapted for Sci-Fi Radio Theatre production by Galen Porter. Last week's episode began with a special session of the Security Committee of Texas Aero Design and Research. Rose Nelson, head of the computer wing, was the last one to arrive. She quickly assessed that one strange face at the table must be a government man. Rose was questioned about Alice Penfold, the company's best computer programmer. Alice Penfold was a brilliant woman and was recognized in her field as an innovator developing a breakthrough technique that was being put into Forstan by IBM. The discussion revolved around Alice's increasingly eccentric behavior. Rose was confronted with material from Alice's private files and asked to explain the content. She answered that Alice was assembling a cross-section of human experience in order to enter it into the computer. She was studying people who have lived, some of them a little worse for wear. To appease the committee, Rose agreed to keep Alice and her experiments off of the company computers. We then encountered Alice on the street studying Abraham, a mystic with sandwich boards who claimed he had met God. Alice approached Abraham and convinced him to come to a party and meet a man who had proof that God had died in 1952. Join us as we attend the party in tonight's episode. They stopped again at a drive-in restaurant where Abraham ate two hamburgers. It was well past dark when they left for Big Mike's party. Big Mike lived in a stone tower behind where a mansion had once stood on the city's near west side. The mansion erased five years earlier by the inevitable ball of progress, had been built before the turn of the century as a townhouse for one of North Texas' most successful cattle barons, one who had found oil beneath his pastures. A half century ago, it had been a cornerstone for silk stocking row. Now only the traces of its foundations were visible the once spacious grounds encroached upon by sleek new insurance and mortgage title firms. The stone tower behind the vanished mansion held a huge water tank used back in the day when each home had its own well, pump and storage facility. The decaying tank was still there, the rooms below once spacious quarters for servants had been converted into fairly comfortable apartments. The lane leading to the tower offered parking space for 30 or 40 cars, and the complete absence of nocturnal neighbors made Big Mike's pad an ideal party site. As Alice and Abraham turned into the parking area, Mike came bounding out into the headlights beam. Despite the heat, he wore his farmer's hat. Mexican slip-over wool poncho, Levi's and English Wellington boots. Hey, there's the professor. He yelled to the crowd milling on the lawn behind him. Let's hear it for the professor. Hip, 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 hooray. 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 hip, 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 Alice and Abraham climbed out of the Vokes. Alice had never been a professor, but with her slim, studious build and horn-rimmed glasses, the tag seemed irrefutable. Abraham clung to the Vokes door, defiant. They're all right, just a little loud. This is Big Mike, our host. Abraham wary and Big Mike, curious, shook hands. Big Mike was a writer who had never written anything. 
He believed every man should have an occupation, and he had chosen writing. Thus far, he had not found a theme he felt worthy of his talent and effort. But he had introduced himself as a writer for so long, everyone assumed that some day he would cease soaking up experiences and impressions long enough to sit down and write something. Also, on nights when the moon was ripe and the juices mellow, Big Mike would describe the stories he might write someday. They were good. Mike, Big Mike was widely known as a writer. Everyone forgot that he'd never written anything. Mike saw the sandwich sign Alice was tugging out of the books. Hey, Professor, which side of Synth Street are you working tonight? This belongs to Abraham. Abraham once died, experienced astral projection, went to heaven, returned, and has come here to tell us about it. She helped Abraham strap on the heavy sandwich sign. Wonderful. The party was beginning to drag. He stepped behind Abraham and studied the back of the sign. When did this happen? The dying, I mean. Two years ago, I saw God. Alice pulled the hand signs out of the car. Let's not talk about it here. Let's all listen to Abraham's story. Then you and he can debate. Great. Mike understood why Alice had brought Abraham to the party. He marched forward into the light and raised the small sign that read, Eternity, where? Listen, everybody, we're going to have us a ring tail theological debate. We have a gentleman with us tonight, Mr. Abraham here, who says he died and went to heaven two years ago and saw God. I say God died in 1952. We will debate, no holds barred, until truth stands stark naked right here in the moonlight. An enthusiastic cheer followed this announcement. Groups began strolling out onto the lawn, expectant, watching Alice and Abraham as they walked into the light. More came out of the house, where they had been listening to records, to see what the yelling was all about. Alice studied the crowd. She knew most of them. There were several habitués of the cellar, the town's last surviving beatnik hangout, a liberal sprinkling of newspaper people and their spouses and dates, some art and writing students from the university, and some that defied classification. Big Mike put a heavy arm around Alice's shoulders. This is going to be dry work. Let us go replenish our bodily juices. They passed a keg of beer nestled in a number two wash tub on ice on the screened in porch and headed for Big Mike's hard liquor in the kitchen. They had to thread their way through the living room where couples were sprawled on the floor listening to Woody Guthrie's scratchy vocal cords lament about a dust storm. Alice couldn't understand this thing these young people had about the depression. Most of them had not been born then. As they entered the kitchen, Alice Abraham recoiled visibly at the array of liquor bottles, bumping his signs against the door jamb. What'll it be? Scotch and water. I no longer drink vile spirits. Big Mike winced. You win round one. Drink is for those of us with visions of hell. He downed a jigger neat as he mixed himself another bourbon on the rocks. How would you like to proceed in the debate, Mr. Abraham? Yeah, I do not desire a debate. I just have a story to tell. Big Mike nodded. Well said. I too have only a story to tell. What say we first tell our stories, and from there we can discuss any truths that may arise? That would be satisfactory. Wonderful. Shall we return to our audience? 
As they went out the kitchen door and circled back to the crowd on the lawn, Mike again put his arm around Alice's shoulder. Professor, Betsy was looking all over for you earlier. I think she's kind of browned off at you for not showing. Where is she? Big Mike searched the crowd around them. I don't know. I haven't seen her in the last 30 or 40 minutes. Alice shrugged. Betsy was probably off in a car, necking with someone. Alice found a comfortable place and sprawled in the grass, her notebook handy. Big Mike walked to the front of his audience, took a long drink from his glass, then raised it in the direction of the water tower, looming above them in the moonlight. Your attention, please. We will proceed thusly. Our honored guest, Mr. Abraham here, will offer an opening statement, wherein he will tell his story. Afterward, I shall make a brief opening statement concerning my experiences. And from there, we will pursue knowledge of life's mysteries. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Abraham. Abraham walked out into the light beside Big Mike and looked at Alice for reassurance. Alice winked and nodded. Abraham took a deep breath, adjusted the shoulder straps on the sandwich sign, and waited for the brief spatter of applause to subside. Big Mike sank respectfully to the grass. I died. Abraham said firmly in the silence that followed. He hesitated, defiant, as if waiting for contradiction. There was none. Abraham slowly raised his hands, palms up, in a saintly gesture. But before I died, I was a sinner, a powerful sinner. I spent my early years as a wastrel. I drank vile spirits. I, I chased loose women in devious enterprises. I took food from the mouths of children. I, I worshiped mammon, forsaking God. But then one night, Drunk on lust and sneaky Pete, I had a heart attack. He paused dramatically, his hands on the sandwich sign over his heart, eyes wide in horror of the memory. I died. My, my breast filled with pain. My heart stopped beating. I felt my heart stop beating. The terror and agony made me sober in an instant. And friends, in that last moment, I prayed. I prayed to the Almighty to forgive my sins, terrible as they were. And that is all I remember of that night on this earth. His hands returned to the saintly gesture. They tell me an ambulance rushed my body to a hospital. There, a, a young intern opened my chest and massaged my heart. Through this young intern, God's miracle was wrought. If it had been an older doctor, he, he would have known I was an old derelict with a bad heart, bad liver, bad kidneys, and rotten, worthless place throughout my misused, decrepit body. A an older doctor, knowing that my death was a thorn of the tree I had planted my riotous living, would have signed the death certificate without a second thought. But through the grace of God, this young intern was fresh from medical school training, eager to use his healing skill. With God's help, he brought me back to life. Abraham paused again, breathing deeply. His audience was quiet, attentive. But, but before that young intern brought me back to life, I was dead. I felt my soul leave my body. 
from a distance, I, I looked down on my rotten, misused body. I, I floated there above it, looking down, and saw it, my own dead, worn-out body. But I was glad. I felt peace. I felt a deeper peace than I've ever known. Soon, I was walking amidst wildflowers with sheep grazing on a meadow below, and, and then, then I heard the Lord. He said, take my hand, Abraham, and we will walk together. I felt a hand take mine, a warm, strong hand full of life. I, I looked up and gazed on a face. Oh, friends, there are not enough words in the English language or in all the languages of the world to describe that face. To gaze upon it is to know peace, to know contentment. Yes, friends, I saw God. We walked hand in hand. And then he said, you must go back, Abraham, because your job on earth is not yet done. You must do my work among the sinners. Abraham shook his huge, shaggy head sadly. I remember no more. I, I slept. I, I woke in the hospital. They told me I had died six times before my heart started beating again properly. The miracle of my dying again and again was printed in the newspapers throughout the world. But people don't recognize true miracles anymore. Lazarus died only once. I died six times. And now I, I carry the word of God to the multitudes in the only way I know how, because I'm not a talking preacher. In the days of our Lord, Preachers were simple men, but today a talking preacher must have a college education. The only school that I have is the Bible. Friends, I don't just have faith because I believe. I have faith because I know. I know because I have died and seen heaven in all its glory. Abraham lowered his head and stepped back into the shadows. A murmur of discussion arose in the audience. Alice made notes. Someone asked from behind her. What did you think about that, Professor? Very interesting. His experiences closely parallel observations of the American Society for Psychical Research and the P Parapsychology Foundation, peace, and the absence of fear seem to be a prevalent phenomena at death. What about that floating up and looking back and seeing himself? Also fairly common. There are mystics who claim they have trained themselves to sustain astral projection for short periods of time, even to travel and to enter closed rooms. Hey, that would be a handy trick. Not if you didn't have your body along. Someone struck a chord on a guitar and sang to the tune of Old Blue. And when I die, I know what I'll do. I'll become an incubus and I'll visit you. The laughter and appreciative applause failed to distract the curious youth behind Alice. What about that stuff of seeing God? I'll have to admit, that is pretty unusual. You ain't heard nothing yet. Big Mike stood swaying slightly in the glare of the porch lights, legs widespread, hands clutching the V of his Mexican poncho. If I may have your attention, I will make my opening statement. The murmur of discussion died away. Alice turned a page in her notebook and waited. Big Mike's views were well known, but not the reasons, for he'd never talked about them. But now, as Alice anticipated, 
Mike was well oiled, loquacious. In the beginning was the word, and the word was at 0500, all hands will fall out and draw 200 rounds of ammunition, four grenades, and get their collective asses in gear. And we went out into the multitudes, gentle brethren, and we slew them. The North Koreans romping down out of the hills like the biblical plagues of locusts, and we slew them. We baptized them with holy fire in the name of Harry S. Truman, Douglas MacArthur, and George Follinsby Babbitt. We were victorious. Like our older brothers in the Great War called Two, we made the world safe for democracy, Rafael Trujillo, and Chiang Kai-shek. Korea was secured. We won the war. He paused for a moment, raised his face slightly, and closed his eyes in concentration. Then, my brethren, the enemy crossed the Yalu. They blew their little bugles of doom, and they came. By the light of the star shells, we could see the great human tide pouring forth to overwhelm us. And believe me, brethren, it overwhelmed us. Big Mike raised the bottom of his poncho to show a string of ugly red welts stitched across his naked midsection. And I, my brethren, was sorely afflicted. Matter of fact, I was left for dead. Around me, my company was wiped out. The enemy rolled on until they hit our reserves a thousand yards to the rear. I was alone, wounded, in no man's land. Big Mike turned to look at Abraham in the shadows behind him. And I too prayed, Mr. Abraham. I cried out, oh God, save me, be with me. And suddenly, in the void of the foxhole, with me, there was a form. And a voice said, Don't sweat it, Mac. I'm here. Who are you? Quit yelling, damn it. They could probably hear you in Peking. I'm praying. Don't waste your breath. God doesn't have time for you tonight. He's dying. He's what? He's dying. God will die within the hour. You know, good son of a bitch. What do you mean? How many times I got to tell you, God is dying. Man has killed him. God will die within the hour. That's impossible. God is immortal. God is also all powerful. Certainly he's capable of dying if he wants to. He wouldn't chicken out like that. Look, stupid, how could a God of perfection live in the sight of man's imperfection? Man that he created in his own image? God has been sick of man, sick unto his death for 2,000 years. <clears throat> and this morning, <clears throat> just before dawn, he took a turn for the worse. God will die within the hour. <clears throat> how do you know? Let's just say that I'm in communication. You're crazy. God wouldn't suicide. He has lost the will to live. I'm dying too. What will happen to me? What do you want to happen to you? I want to be immortal. Immortality is an impossible burden. Even God couldn't bear it. Right now I could. Your view is extremely limited. It's difficult for a mortal to contemplate immortality. It's even more difficult for an immortal to contemplate mortality. But all things are relative. Time shifts, time curves. We all come and go through the void. All that breathe are only the visible portion of the iceberg of humanity. One man's birth is another man's death. So in a sense, we are all immortal, and in another sense, we are all mortal. But don't sweat it, Mac. You're not dying. You aren't to die from this plane until the war we call three, and that's some time off. How do you know? I checked your records.
what will happen to me then? There are some things in this world that are intended to be mysteries. Big Mike gave his audience a few seconds to reflect on that. Somewhere about there, I lost consciousness. The next morning, just after dawn, a patrol came up to see if any of us were alive. They found me, shot me full of morphine, and began dressing my wounds. What about my buddy there, I asked. They rolled the corpse. He's dead, they said. But he talked to me last night. They told me, not him, no larynx, no head either. Big Mike doffed his straw hat and bowed slightly toward Abraham. On that, I rest my case. His voice rose above the ensuing murmur of discussion. We'll knock off now for 30 minutes to stretch our legs, get a fresh drink, and answer calls from nature, not necessarily in that order. And then we'll have us one big-ass theological shootout. Betsy came back. She sat down beside Alice and looked at her curiously. Where you been? She asked, not accusing, just asking. I've been around. Where you been? Her eyes didn't waver. I've been around. Her hair was awry in places and her lips bore evidence of some bruising activity. Betsy, bless her, was insatiable. Good to have you back. Betsy stretched out on the grass and put her head on Alice's thigh. Big Mike brought them drinks and flopped beside them. Alice worked on her notebook. Several couples gathered around, intrigued with the symbols she used. What are you working on, Professor? The question was so routine, Alice answered it automatically. I am assembling the wide spectrum of human experience and reducing it to computer terms. Is she serious? I don't know. I only believe about half of what the professor says. Could your computer give me the plot for a bestseller? Sure. I could feed the plots of current bestsellers in and arrive at a composite. That ought to be a bestseller. Big Mike thought about it for a moment. I'd hate to prostitute my talents that way. But I guess after I wrote a bestseller, then I could turn my attention to writing literature. How does a computer work anyway? Just like your brain, child. Not my brain. I hate to tell you what my stupid, ignorant, male chauvinist daddy used to say about my brain. But she did. She always did. He used to say, honey, it's sure a good thing you got an ass on you. Because you sure ain't got no brains. In your case, more than ample compensation. But we're all in the same league where computers are concerned. The simplest computer is capable of doing things the best human brain couldn't. And the simplest brain can do the one thing that the most sophisticated computer can't. Originate thought. A computer can only do the things we know how to tell it to do. If they can think, how do they work? Think is a relative term. If we show them how, they can make decisions. They are capable of counseling and going back until they find the right one. But we have to show them how. Teach them. I can see training a dog, but I don't see how you could teach a machine anything. Teaching them, programming, is the biggest obstacle we face. Computers are growing so complex so rapidly, we can't operate them anywhere near capacity because we don't fully understand them. They were designed by other computers. We can't even talk to them directly. We have to feed our data through a simpler computer that translates. Our machines are running far ahead of our capacity to use them. That's frightening. 
Suppose they do start having ideas, not telling what they might do. That'll never happen because of their basic nature. It always infuriates me for somebody to personify a computer, make it an animated object. A computer is no more than a storage unit, an extension of our own brain. We can put positive and negative signals in it for safekeeping, and it will feed them back on demand. That's why we use binary numbers, just one and zero in combinations, a negative positive yes no signal. A computer can answer yes or no a million times a second. Geez, that sometimes stirs me up just once a night. A computer is a beautiful instrument. It never gets emotionally involved. The human programmer can get agitated, irritated, or upset, but not the computer. It demands perfection. Its reasoning is cold and clear, unaffected by what it wants the answer to be, what it had for breakfast, the blonde in the lobby, or inner office jealousies. There is nothing in the world for it except the problem at hand and the factors of the problem that have been fed into it. A computer is the ultimate in logical reasoning because it has no phobias, psychological experiences, or prejudices. You talk like you're in love with the damn thing. I'm not in love with the machine. I'm in love with what it can do. When we learn to use these machines, I mean really use them, humanity will be freed for the first time as a thinker. By using the computer as an extension of the mind, we will be able to filter out our mortal flaws. How can they use it when they are losing sight of how it works? Because basically the computer is simple. The theory has been around for a long time. A man named Babbage tried to build one way back in the 1800s. The cogs and levers were all he had to work with. Transistors and the small, almost microscopic memory cores have made practical computers possible. We now have computers that can store almost a million bits of information. The brain, one in good shape, may hold 10 billion. Before long, we may have computers with such a capacity and in a desktop model. It could empty its memory store in a few minutes, everything that might register on a human brain during the entire lifetime. What if they do start having ideas and turn on us? There's an old corny but true line about that. You can always reach down and pull the plug. The audience gathered again on the lawn. Big Mike leaned back, swaying slightly, and stared at the big stone tower rising above them in the moonlight. My phallic symbol. He turned to Abraham. Are you ready to resume? I am ready. All right. But I warn you, I'm drunk, and I'm going to say profound things. Are you ready on the left, ready on the right, ready for the firing line? Commence firing. He bowed in Abraham's direction. I would rather ask a question. W were you implying that the figure in the foxhole was God? The inference is yours, sir. I did not say it. But you implied it. Do you have another explanation? A uh, hallucination with all those bullets in you. Perhaps you were out of your head for a while. <laughs> the same explanation could apply to your experiences. Abraham drew himself up to his full height and glared at Big Mike. But I died six times. Maybe I died. We know I died but we don't know for a fact that you died. Maybe I never lived. Maybe none of us ever lived. Do you ever think of that? Abraham frowned. Now you're making fun of me. No. 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 Big Mike's voice rose earnestly. I've never been more serious. Joseph Conrad once wrote something to the effect that there are almost enough marvels and mysteries in this world for us to consider life as an enchanted state. 
Maybe he's right. Maybe life as we know it is only a hallucination. No, I, I cannot believe that. I, I can feel my heart beating. My brain is thinking thoughts. My, my tongue is speaking to you. Therefore, I, I must exist, live. A, and when I died, my existence continued. I continued to live. Maybe the hallucination continued. No, I continued to think, to be aware. Therefore, I continued to live. Uh, you don't understand what I mean. I accept your assertion that you died and floated around like some kind of ethereal fart. I felt the same thing that night in Korea, and I've read Papa Hemingway's description of that happening to him when he was wounded in Italy. What I'm saying is, maybe we exist somewhere else. Remember the story of the Chinese prince who slept and dreamed he was a butterfly? When he awoke, he couldn't figure out whether he was a Chinese prince who had dreamed he was a butterfly or was now a butterfly dreaming he was a Chinese prince. That's what I mean. Maybe this time on earth is a sort of dream state, a, a hallucination in that other existence, a sort of hiatus in that other life. Abraham worried the shoulder straps of his sandwich board into a more comfortable position while he thought about Mike's theory. I suppose it is possible. Good, we are agreed it's possible. Our basic disagreement then is that you saw God. I knew I saw God. I talked with him. Abraham, you have accepted the possibility that perhaps you were floating around in a sort of hallucination. What makes you so certain you didn't imagine, dream maybe, that you saw God? I talked with him. Well, let's look at the other side of the coin. If you were floating around out there, don't you suppose there are others floating around out there too? Now, just for the sake of argument, let's say I'm right, that God is dead. Don't you think one of those others would try to take his place? There is only one God. Right. There was the God that created heaven and earth, breathed life into a handful of dust and called, called it Adam, then took a rib to start the whole mess. But that God has wearied of the world and is dead. Now man has created other gods, many others. I will not discuss pagan religions. Why not? You're living right in the midst of one bigger than all your Christian churches put together. What is that? Haven't you heard? We have a new religion and a new deity, the great god of the blue eye. General Sarnoff sent us his only begotten son, Jack Parr, to lead us into salvation. And he has risen through the ratings to paradise. Attend, my brethren, to his disciples, spreading the word throughout the three networks. Now you're turning sacrilegious, profane. Am I? Big Mike raised his arm in a sweep to the sea of lights to the westward. Look, there's America sitting on its collective ass, worshiping the great god of the blue eye. We have built a god of glass and germanium. We follow the wise men who flunked out of B-movies and now interpret our very existence. We have oracles who gain knowledge spinning the top 40. We seek miracles in clean sinks, unstopped nasal passages, and regular bowel movements. Anoint thyselves with deodorant, O brethren, or you will be banished to a fringe area. Keep the proper suds level, and you will be rewarded with visions of angel Ellie May. Adhere to our channel, and you can gain redemption through trading stamps. You blaspheme. God will strike you dead. God can't. God is dead. He staggered toward Abraham. End of episode two.